You're live. All right, everybody. I hope you have your pins. Uh, have your everyone you know how this goes. Uh, keep your folders, and every time you come to Bible study, you're going to have new inserts. Uh, the idea is that by the time we finish through teaching through Revelations, you'll have your own folder of notes. The entire scriptures there with your own handwritten notes and this will be valuable because this is going to help you when you read the revelations in the future to go back and reference and understand kind of understand what you're reading uh we've talked about demystifying revelations because for many people uh it's a mystical book a mysterious book and um very hard to understand. Some people skip revelations or often people will jump around to the juicy parts and skip all the other parts. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. revelation is a, a daunting book. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going together attempt to break it down. Amen. We're gonna pray Amen. tonight, Amen. we're gonna dive up in it and let's do it. Uh, let's open with prayer. Father, we bless your name. We thank you, God. You are good and your mercy endures forever. Yes. Your word is living and true, and it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank so you, today, Lord. God, we dive into this book of revelation, a yes, book Lord. that is a book of hope, a promise yes, uh, that comes with invitation from beginning to end. And Lord, help us to see and hear clearly. Tonight, Lord, instruct us, teach us, and give us insight and give us deep, profound love for your word. Yes, we ask this in Jesus' name, and everyone Jesus says, name. Amen. Amen. If you're watching, I encourage you, uh, unless you're laid up in a hospital bed, uh, to get out to the meetings and, and, and to the Bible study live because we are going to be giving out so much over the next few weeks, and you need to accumulate this booklet and. Uh, uh, if you miss, you know, ask me on a Sunday or during the week, and I'll make sure you get handouts as well. Um, but we're going to dive in to Revelation. Uh, we call it the Revelation. And chapter one is called the prologue and the introduction. The, actually, the very first three verses are called the prologue of the, of the book of Revelation. Uh, who wrote the book of Revelation? Uh, how do we know? <laughs> it's right there, right? And, and we just studied the Gospel of John, and we remember that we have no evidence, direct evidence, that John wrote the Gospel of John. Right. We have indirect evidence. Right. And we're going to see we have evidence right here in Revelation that John is also the writer of the Gospel of John. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to begin by looking at our opening uh, three verses. Someone read it out. Who's going to be the first to have the honor of breaking open Revelation chapter? All right, guys. Come on. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he seen and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Mm. Mm. So John Wesley said this, I by no means pretend to understand mm -hmm. or to explain all that is contained in this mysterious book. Mm. He's talking about the book of Revelation, John Wesley the Great theologian mm -hmm. uh, and really I want to say as a pastor that's the position I take mm -hmm. let me just get the soapbox over with and just <laughs> tell you something up front right. I get real irritated with those who are prophecy experts mm -hmm. who tell you this is what this is this is how it's going to go down mm -hmm. this is who this is right. and they have it all down and they really don't know they just don't know. Right. And, and some things we do know, we're, the things we do know, we're going to make it plain. Here's what the Bible oh, says is going to happen. But some things we don't know, like who the Antichrist is or will be. We don't know. 
we have strong clues. We're going to see some mm-hmm. things that are powerful clues in Revelations and right. where he may come from. Right. But we don't know. But yet people write books. Oh, yeah, we know this is who it's going to be. Or the year of the return of the Lord. Right. We've been over this, right? Yeah. We don't know. <laughs> in fact, how many Amen. times did Jesus have to tell us? It's not for you to know the day nor the hour. Amen. You go right. preach the gospel everywhere in the meantime. It's Good. over and over. In fact, Jesus says, no man knows the day or the hour. Mm-hmm. Who are these birds that claim they know? Mm-hmm. And yet, and then other things that people do uh, as far as the timing of the resurrection or, you know, they have this grand unfolding of events. Uh, Russia is going to invade Israel from the north, and China is going to come over the Tigris River, and uh, and all these things. We don't know. We don't know Russia's going to. Russia's never mentioned in the Bible. That's right. China's never mentioned in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Come on, man. And, and yet, all of these countries are named, and people would say the prophet. Yeah. It's not in the Bible. That's right. It could be. So here's my position. Most of this stuff, I'm going to teach it like this. Some say this. Some say that. Mm -hmm. I lean towards this, Mm -hmm. but we don't know. That's the position you're going to hear over and over and over. All right. Yes, sir. Oh, um, there could be more than one uh, antichrist. Well, we'll cover that when we get to the Antichrist. We don't want to jump ahead of chapter one. <laughs> but, uh, all right, so is that cool? Is that cool? That's my position, really, because it's the authentic way to approach Revelation. Some say this is this. Some say this is that. I feel this because of, and I'll give some supporting reasons why I feel so. But then I'll pray to say, we don't know. We'll know when it happens. We'll know when it happens. And the things we do know, the Lord's coming back. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He's going to destroy the Antichrist and Satan. It's going to be a great great new judgment in New Jerusalem. Uh, A resurrection. We know that. Mm -hmm. Right? And we're going to highlight that stuff. So, so, so. Uh, here's let's dive down into it. That's some things I just want to lay out right up front. Over and over, you're going to hear me tell you. I'm going to tell you honestly. This is different theories. Here's what different people believe it may be. This is what I feel, but we don't know until it happens. Mm-hmm. Right, is that okay? Yeah. Right. So, so here's some some quick truths that I want you to know. In the first three verses. Uh, in the first three verses that you need to know that's vital to reading the rest of this book, right? First of all, it is called the revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Not revelations, plural, like we say in the book of revelations. It's a revelation. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And, And so it is a singular revelation with a central point And that is the revelation of the final chapter in man's history with God in time. Mm -hmm. It's that revelation, the final chapter uh, of the history, man's history, with God and time. And, And so another thing is, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. First four, five verses, there are words there. Six words, how many? Five. Uh, First five words of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. We often say uh, the revelation of John, or we refer to this book as John's Revelation. Mm -hmm. Or we've heard him called John the Revelator. He didn't revelate anything. (laughs) He received the revelation, and whose revelation is it? Jesus. Jesus. Mm -hmm. All right. So our language is it's common to use it elsewhere, but let's just point it out. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And and so it's not John's. And, and here's what I want us to see. Uh, what Jesus is telling us is, is pretty cool that there's this giving and receiving. So it says it's the revelation of Jesus Christ that he received from God. So God, the father gives it to Jesus. 
Because remember when Jesus was on earth, he says, no man knows the day or the hour. I don't know, only the Father in heaven. Yes. Well, now Jesus is glorified. And so now the Father has revealed to Jesus uh, the rest of the plan. And Jesus now gives it to John. And then John gives it to the pastors. And the pastors give it to the churches. That's what's happening here. Right? Right? Mm -hmm. So, so John's the last apostle alive. All the other 12 apostles, 11 apostles are dead, having died horrible deaths for their faith. All of them. John, according to legend, has suffered for his faith. They say he was boiled in oil but survived. And now he is under uh, uh, exile by Emperor Domitian probably wanting John to get out of the picture so he could stop stirring up uh, cities with his preaching. And so he puts John on the island of Patmos. But, but this is the last apostle alive. And so it stands to reason that before he dies, Jesus wants to give him the final revelation, the final word of hope, so that he, in apostolic authority, can pass this to the churches, who the, the pastors, and then you can pass these to the churches. So, so we see this in the first three verses, this order. Now, notice what he says. He says, these are the things that must shortly take place. Now, how many of y'all know some of these things still haven't happened yet in Revelations? Mm -hmm. So what did he mean by it's going to shortly take place when 2,000 years later, some of these things haven't even happened yet? With just off, off the cuff, what do you think that means? Things that will shortly take place. Well, it also says a thousand years is like one day for God. That's right. So like it's a different different word, concept. Yeah. Great, great grab for scripture. That's probably yes. you know, that would apply, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, one day is like a thousand years. Uh, but I'll go a step, a little bit step, a little bit more practical step when it comes to what's happening here. Remember that Jesus is about to give instructions and appraisals of seven churches that existed then. So when he says things that are shortly to take place, he literally means shortly referring to these seven churches. I want you to write to these seven churches because there's some things that are about to go down and I'm gonna evaluate each one of them and give them instructions and give them a bid what they need to do. So yeah, there are some things that are about to go down right then, but that doesn't mean that the entire revelation is about things that were about to happen right then because Verse 19, he makes it a little bit more plain. What does he say? He says, write the things that you have seen and the things which are, present tense, and the things that will take place after this. So that's future tense. So yes, he is addressing present tense. He will address present tense, but the overwhelming majority of the book is going to be future tense. Right? So the next three chapters are going to be present tense. And then after chapter four, things go down and it's all future tense. Okay? So, so, so sometimes people see this and they kind of get confused because it seems like Jesus is implying that everything you're about to read was for then and now, uh, then and uh, present, but it's not. Okay? So let me show y'all something else. Look at look at uh, look at verse one and two. That he sent and signify it by his angel to his servant John. Look at verse two, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Where have we heard this language? John. All over John, yeah. Thank you. 
it, it does sound a whole lot like the first chapter of John, though, doesn't it? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made, right? And, uh, and then he goes on and says, uh, there was a man sent from God. Uh, he came to bear witness to the light, right? So, so yeah, you see this uh, same language. In fact, you read the first chapter of the epistle of First John, and it says the same thing. That which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which we have handled, the word. Uh, and, and so this is a big, big uh, clue that John also wrote the Gospel of John. Because mm -hmm. remember, the entire Gospel of John, there's this over, overlying um, uh, <coughs> principle. And what was that principle? Yes, mm -hmm. in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Yeah. Testify, witness, testify, witness, mm -hmm. two or three, two or three, yeah. testify, witness. And now we see it here at the second verse of this opening chapter. And this John is all over it. And so we have John here using this language, same language, same theme of the Gospel of John and the Epistles of John. It's all connected, right? And so I just wanted to point that out. This is a very John uh, book, all right? So we know who the recipient of Revelation is. We know it is John the Apostle. And he's using the very same language of the Gospel of John. All right, so uh, verse three uh, gives us something that other books don't give us. It says there is a blessing that is promised for those who read and hear the words of this prophecy. Hmm. I don't know what kind of blessing, uh, but I know is that if God linked a blessing to hearing and reading this book, we're blessed tonight. Lord, what kind of blessing is going to follow us when we walk out the door? We're reading and hearing the prophecy of the revelation. And you said, Lord, that there's a blessing for those who do so. So Amen. you're blessed tonight. Amen. And uh, so Amen. keep coming back on Wednesday night for your blessing. Amen. Right? Amen. So it, it's promised, it's attached. And also those who keep the things written in it because we will live as if the time is near all right everybody on board that's just the intro that's the prologue the first three verses and uh but here's some things here's some things we need to know about the book of revelation one john the apostle the last apostle wrote revelation while he was a political prisoner of dimension emperor dimension uh, he was placed on the Isle of Patmos around the year 92 to 96 AD. So, so John, John was an old man here. They say he was about, and he was in his late 90s. Uh, he died about age 99 to maybe 100 and something. Uh, so, so John is on his last leg here, right? Uh, and so, so. The church is about 60 something years old. The church, since Jesus ascended into heaven, about 60 something years have gone by. And, and so, six decades of church planting, evangelizing, preachers going, ministering, uh, elders being established, reproduction happening. And, and 60 years' time, they've infiltrated the Roman Empire enough so that John has been exiled for his faith. The emperor himself exiled John. When you have grown to the emperor knows who you are, you've impacted the community. You're not some secret little, you know, fly-by-night sect, fly-by-night fly sect somewhere. You are known. And now the church is going through this persecution under dimension. And so, in fact, under his rule, uh, the emperor had several phases of persecution of the church, um, not to the degree later that Nero would and others would do, but 
but uh, it was. And so uh, the church was expecting and was going through persecutions. And John's going to, uh, Jesus is going to mention this persecution to the seven churches. All right. So here's the thing about the persecution of the church. Number one, uh, believe it or not, Christians were considered atheists by Roman citizens. Mm -hmm. Why do you think Christians were considered atheists by the Romans? Not just that we had one God. We didn't believe in any of their gods. We said their gods didn't exist. Therefore, we're what? Atheists. <laughs> so, so one, they thought we were uh, Christians were atheists. Uh, so because of this, whenever there was some type of misfortune, Vesuvius explodes, earthquake somewhere, uh, crops fail, uh, Romans would think the gods are upset. And everyone had this duty, this civic duty, to sacrifice and worship and honor the gods to bring favor. But Christians didn't believe in the Roman gods, and therefore, if disaster hit, whose fault was it? Christians. You Christians aren't doing your duty. You're not honoring the gods, and now disaster has come. So there was animosity to the Christians. Uh, even though Paul, in his writings, encourages people, Honor rulers, honor the king, pay your taxes, obey local laws in order to be in good standing and to be in a good witness. However, they rejected idols and Roman religion, and therefore they brought intense persecution upon themselves. All right. Also, Christians were held in suspicion because they had secret gatherings. And literally in the early church, uh, churches weren't just open like now. Hey, let's get everyone in. Let's invite them off the streets. Let's try to get as many into the house. Not in the early church. Not in the first three, four centuries. You could only come to the gathering if you were saved, sanctified, spirit-filled believer. Mm. Now, now in the early days, people met in houses, and, and sometimes it was in the open courtyard, and there was the chance that an unbeliever would come in and a believing spouse, maybe servants in the house would be unbelievers. And, be and Paul addresses that if by chance in 1 Corinthians 14, an unbeliever comes in your midst. He addresses it, but for the most part, first three centuries, you did not go to the gathering because the clear belief about the church was that it was the ecclesia, the called out and gathered, or the gathering of the called out. And so if you were not called out, you were not born again, you were not part of the ecclesia, you didn't come to the gathering. Because in the gathering, they did communion time. And communion was the body of Christ. And if you weren't saved, you weren't part of the body. And therefore, Romans saw Christians having secret meetings. We're not allowed even though they're meetings. No, you're pagans. Uh, but if you get saved, we'll gladly add you to the, to the meeting. So they were looked at suspicious. Secondly, about this, the Romans accused the Christians of cannibalism. They said, oh yeah, they're having these secret meetings and they're eating human flesh. Where'd they get that from? Yeah, communion. They heard this language, you know, that oh, this is the body of Christ. And so they didn't understand this. And so... They were accusing Christians of gathering in secret meetings and practicing cannibalism. Yeah. All right. So all this misunderstanding. And so uh, Christians were accused, arrested, often executed across the Roman Empire. And, and so the revelation that John's receiving here, Jesus is going to war and he's going to encourage uh, the churches of Asia during this time of persecution, uh, but most of all, he's coming to encourage churches by giving them a glimpse of the final chapter. Yeah, you're about to go through some persecution. Yes, you're sitting in the very seat of Satan where you are, guys. Yes, uh, you know, there's people that are coming in and you're about to go through a really tough trial, but here's something you should know. You win. You're going to 
you're going to get the final say. Jesus is coming back again. So Revelation was a powerful encouragement to an intensely persecuted church. Right? Um, so John, uh, during this time of persecution, he's exiled to the island of Patmos. And you could go there today. It's a common Christian uh, pilgrimage site. Uh, from a couple of the Greek islands, you can ferry over to it, the island of Mikos, and a couple other islands that are pretty close. And it's a tiny area, but people live there, about 3,000 people still live on the island of Patmos today. Uh, so it's worth the trip next time you're island hopping in the Greek islands. Uh, uh, again, Domitia probably, Domitian probably put him there uh, to keep him isolated from the church. The book of Revelation uses repetition and repetition of phrases in the scripture usually indicates imminence and urgency. Uh, it's also very common in apocalyptic language, uh, in time, uh, wrath of God language. Uh, there's a lot of repetition to big, give emphasis and uh, and also, it, repetition in the scripture is present in passages that were meant to be read aloud, especially passages that were meant to be memorized. So sometimes when you're reading through the Bible, say like Amos, you read through the book of Amos and you got, you'll see a lot of repetition of phrases. And it's because it was orally transmitted and this helped with uh, memorization and flow. So, so, but most of all in Revelation, repetition is there uh, to bring emphasis and urgency. One thing that is represent, uh, uh, repeated often that we should not miss, and that is the Lord is coming yeah. or the time is near. That's repeated throughout the book. It is the urgency of this book. The Lord is coming or the time is near. We've already seen the time is near already once, right? Uh, there's another number that is repeated in this book. Does anyone know what number that is? Seven. Seven. Seven is listed 51 times in the book of Revelation. It's insane how many times seven. We are in chapter one and seven's already uh, repeating itself over and over and over. It, it, if you don't believe seven is God's number, well, the, everything that's breaking open in Revelation is God's design, and it's all in sevens, mm -hmm. right? And so, so seven is repeated 51 times. It's God's number of, uh, of completion. All right, any questions so far? Um, we're good? Mm -hmm. um, you, you said that all the, the apostles are dead. Yeah. Um, there was one apostle that Jesus loved. Yeah. And, um, oh man, I forgot, I can't remember the rest. But basically, um, I can't remember it, but basically there was this one apostle mm -hmm. that Jesus loved. And, and um, basically, um, I can't remember it, but basically they, they, they believe the same apostle is alive to this day, this day right now. Well, that probably is not possible because that apostle would be John. The beloved apostle is John. And that's who's receiving this revelation. And we know about his death because of Polycarp. When John was about to die, he instituted or uh, appointed, uh, instituted, appointed Polycarp to take his place as Bishop of Asia Minor. And Polycarp was also martyred. He was thrown to the lions and burned at the stake. Um, but, uh, and then I think Polycarp appointed Justin Martyr to be his replacement. So, so Polycarp's reading, in fact, a really cool read, uh, you can find it on Google, it's free and it's very short, is the martyrdom of Polycarp. Go read it. Yeah, it, it, it will be sobering. The martyrdom of Polycarp, P-O-L-Y-C-A-R-P. And Polycarp was discipled and appointed by John the Beloved before his death to be Bishop of Asia Minor. But, but man, Polycarp was a cool dude. 
Um, and I liked his writings. I like his writings, but also his martyrdom. It's just a very short read, uh, but you'll enjoy it. All right? Good. All right. Let's get on here. Uh, someone read this verse 4 through 8, and it's packed with stuff. Uh, so let's read it, and let's try to break this down. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is who is and who was and who is to come, mm. and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins mm. in his own blood, mm. and he has made us kings and priests in his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Mm. Behold, mm. He is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Mm -hmm. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come. Y'all see all the repetition? Mm -hmm. Y'all see the repetition, repetition here? Mm -hmm. uh, amen, by the way, is thrown out is all through. Uh, the book of Revelation as well, which means so be it, mm -hmm. right? And its emphasis is uh, emphasis is throughout the book as well. All right, but here we see. Well, let me not go ahead of myself. First of all, who's he addressing in verse four? First, verse four, he's addressing who? Oh, the seven churches. Seven churches of Asia. Mm -hmm. Right. Before we get to the meat that all of you are here to hear about. We're going to walk through the seven churches of Asia first, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. uh, there's a lot in there, and there's a reason they're addressed, and we'll talk about them. Uh, in fact, it's just if you're taking the notes, it's on there. One of one of the possible reasons that that he addresses the seven churches of Asia, even though there's churches in Jerusalem and in Spain by that by this time, uh, there's churches in uh, in Rome and Italy. And in, in, uh, where today is modern Germany, um, I, maybe the Isle, not the Isles, not yet, but, but there's churches growing uh, everywhere. But these seven churches were, were your mega churches at the time. They were solid churches. They were established churches. But one of the reasons that he addresses these seven could be that they are lined among uh, along a major trade route, ancient trade route, beginning at Ephesus, I didn't pull up the picture that shows the route, but it goes in a in a in a triangle, starting at Ephesus, up to Smyrna, over to Philadelphia, uh, down to Colossae, over to Laodicea, and it makes a big triangle. And it was a trade route, and these churches were strategic in this trade route. I mean, whoever planted these churches and spread these churches, actually Paul planted the church at Ephesus. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then you know, different disciples spread them out. It was strategic. Every major city along this major trade route. And so, so it could be, many believe, that uh, they, they gave, they, Jesus addresses these churches beginning at Ephesus because the idea was that Jesus gives the revelation to John. John gives the revelation to the pastors, beginning with Ephesus. Mm -hmm. So it's carried to Ephesus from the island, island of Patmos, and the pastor there receives it and reads it to his congregation, stirs them all up. Then it goes to the next town, Smyrna. Then it goes to the next town, Pergamos, and it makes its route along the trade route, church to church, and so, so by hitting this trade route, all these churches from there, this this revelation could be spread throughout all the empire where the churches are. And so, so it's quite possible this was very strategic. Also, uh, John was the bishop of Asia Minor. So, so it would stand the reason that if John is bishop of Asia Minor, he's going to receive this revelation. Who's the first? Church, who's the first, where's the first region? Is he going to be responsible for getting this revelation to Asia Minor? 
And these are churches of Asia Minor. We call them the seven churches of Asia, but we're referring to Asia Minor. Uh, so the Bishop of Asia Minor receives the revelation and he will first disseminate it to the region he is Bishop over and there's seven churches under his watch. And from there, they will begin to spread. So because the seven churches are the first recipients of the revelation, Every one of them is addressed individually, right? Mm -hmm. Now, notice what, what he says here. Um, he is talking, uh, he addresses himself as he who was, or he who is, he who was, and he who is, is to come. It's a phrase signifying the eternal nature of God, eternity past, eternity present, and eternity future. There is no moment where he has not been. Notice this expression, um, grace and peace to you from him who is and was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne. Mm. All right, you're sitting down. Uh, at your study table, you're going to read the book of Revelation. You come to this verse, you see this phrase, seven spirits before his throne. You keep reading or you stop and wonder, what are these seven spirits? And if you've wondered what they are, uh, what have you concluded? What are these seven spirits? Seven spirits before the throne of God. No one thought about it. We never caught that, that little clause. Well, I'll give it to you. Isaiah 11 and 2, it's a messianic phrase. In referring to the Messiah, Jesus, in Isaiah 11, Isaiah talks about seven attributes of the Spirit that would rest upon the Messiah or Christ. And there they are. Uh, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of bite, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And so uh, this is a statement referring to, to Christ himself. Uh, and so it's a messianic statement. So God the Father, who, who is, who was, and is to come, the eternal God, and he that has the seven spirits, before the throne of God, Jesus himself, uh, are, are, are speaking here. All right? I want to pay attention to the high Christology of this, of this, of this. Look what it says about Jesus here. Man, it's like a pause for a praise break. Uh, it immediately begins to exalt Christ, <coughs> just like the first chapter of the Gospel of John. In the beginning, he was the Word. He was there in the beginning. He was with God. He is God. So there's this was, is, and is the come thing. Uh, he created all things. The word became flesh. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, he was the light sent into the world, and the white light shined in the darkness, and the darkness couldn't comprehend it. I mean, John is his high praise. And so it is here. Let's look at some of the things in, uh, that we see in this passage concerning Jesus. Uh, number one, he's the faithful witness. He's called the firstborn or first fruit from the dead. Uh, he's ruler over all kingdoms. He's the one who loved us. He's the one who washed us in his blood. He made us to be kings and priests. To him belongs all glory and all dominion. And he's the one that is coming again in the clouds. All of this in this little short, short section. All right. Christ exalted. And, and it's important for us to understand uh, that John uh, is giving this, this uh, revelation not from the Jesus he saw ascend and the Jesus he knew before the ascension, but from the exalted, glorified Christ. Pay attention to this. I, let me, I don't want to go out of order here. 
in Revelation 1 and 11, you see this. I'm jumping ahead. Okay. Actually, I guess I didn't put verse 9 through 11 on here, uh, but you have it. So somebody read out loud verse 9, 10, and 11. Thank you. Okay. First of all, remember in verse eight, we first see the use of the phrase Alpha and Omega beginning in the end, the Lord. And now, uh, as Uta just read, um, we see it again in verse 11. Now, we're going to address that in a second, but look at verse 10 in your notes. John was in the Spirit when? On the Lord's Day. On the Lord's Day. That's when he received this revelation. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to point something out about the Lord's Day. Mm -hmm. And throughout the early church, and even in the book of Acts and the epistles, the Lord's Day was a re reference to Sunday, the first day of the week. Now, the Jews didn't call it Sunday. They have a different word for it, but, but it was the first day of the week. We call it Sunday. And so the Lord's Day, it was called because that was the day Jesus resurrected on the first day of the week. So they started calling it the Lord's Day. Mm -hmm. So John, 60-something uh, years into the early church, is still referring to Sunday as the Lord's Day, right? And I want to just point this out, as opposed to the Sabbath, which was the last day of the week, in the New Testament church, early in the, in the New Testament church, the Lord's Day was reverenced by the church rather than the Sabbath. Uh, it's interesting to note that the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament several, about three times by Jesus, and then Paul repeats them a couple of times. But guess what? All of the commandments, the Ten Commandments, are repeated except one, the fourth, which is remember the keep of the Sabbath. Even when Jesus is talking to the, the rich young ruler and he's saying, yeah, keep, keep these commands. He, he lists these Ten Commandments, but he leaves out the Sabbath. And when Paul is going down the Ten Commandments, he mentions them all. He even mentions the one about honor your mother and father. He says, and kids, there's a promise with that one, so keep that one. But he leaves out, uh, remember the Sabbath day. It's never mentioned. And, and there's a reason... And it's probably very specific because the early church now is honoring the Lord's Day, the Sunday, as a day of worship. And so there's a reason theologically, because remember the Sabbath day is this. Six days you'll labor to earn a day of rest on the Sabbath. But in the New Testament, the first day we enter into a day of rest so that we could sanctify six days of fruitfulness. In other words, Sunday becomes a first fruit day for us. Mm. Everything about our worship is first fruit. Mm. And so we don't work six days to earn a seventh day of rest. We give the first day so that we can sanctify the rest of the week and be productive for the rest of our six days. So the Lord's Day is the first day of the week or the first fruit of the week. And so coming to the house of God and worshiping him is not just about uh, showing up and showing out faithfully. It's about you knowing how to honor the Lord with your first fruits. Amen. Right. It's about first fruits. If we ever got first fruit down, it would change everything about why and how we do what we do. Amen. John 
John was all by himself, I assume, on the Isle of Patmos. He could have been honoring the Lord's Day all by himself. Maybe he was worshiping. I think he had to have been worshiping because he was where? In the Spirit. And so John mentions the day because it was quite obvious that Jesus himself chose the first day to give John his revelation. Jesus chose Sunday <clears throat> while John was worshiping in the spirit. On Sunday, I'm going to give the final book of the Bible. Things happen on Sunday. And look what happens. Um, uh, he comes with the voice of a loud trumpet. And this is going to be a repeated theme throughout the Bible. And when you hear this, uh, you know, he had the voice of a trumpet. And you're going to see it in, all the way up to chapter 4. And then uh, we see trumpets all through the book of Revelation. But when God speaks with the voice of a trumpet, this theme, there's a lot to it. The ancient Jews... Uh, the ancient Jews believed that the voice of God was like the sound of a trumpet. Mm. In fact, uh, there's a couple of verses in the mm. Old Testament that refer uh, to God's voice being that of a trumpet. And that is why the Jews would blow shofars. Mm. They blow the shofars in worship and then going into battle because they believe that the blowing of the shofar confused the enemy. They, they didn't know if it was God coming or what. So low so far as to confuse the enemy and there's a lot to that when it comes to worship and music but but they just believed that he had this voice but but nonetheless it wasn't a trumpet that john hears it was the voice of jesus and it was trumpet like it was a blast it, it, it was uh, melodious it was uh, it, it went forth uh and caught attention and it it was announcing and he says this in verse 11, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Now, pay attention to Isaiah 44 and 6. God says to Isaiah in 44 and 6, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. In Revelations 1 and 8, the Almighty is called the first and the last. Now here, Jesus is saying, I'm the first and the last. Is God the Father and Jesus competing here? How can God the Almighty in Isaiah 44 and uh, Revelation 1 and 8 be the first and the last? But now Jesus says he's the first and the last. In fact, by the time this chapter ends, uh, we're going to see that the first and the last in the Alpha Omega kind of merge together between God Almighty, the Father, and Jesus Christ, the Son, both claiming the same title, no competition involved. What's John doing here? What's, what's Jesus doing? What's Jesus revealing to John? That Jesus is with the Father, and he's right. God with the Father. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I, I don't want to look at it yet, but I like to do something. In, in fact, I'm just going to mention it. Uh, Jehovah Witnesses don't believe Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. And they say that he's the angel Michael. And that he's a created angel. That God created him. He's just an angel. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't worship him uh, or pray to him uh, and so forth. Um, and so I like to sit down with them. And I like to take them to Isaiah 44 and say, who is the first and the last? And they say, oh, that's Jehovah. It's not cool. And then I take them to Revelation 1 and 8, and there it is, first and the last. And I said, who's that? No, that's Jehovah. And you can even take them to verse 11 and say, oh, who's the first and the last? Oh, that's Jehovah. Then you go to verse 18 and says, behold, I am the first and the last. I was dead. But behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I ask them, when did Jehovah die? And they get stumbled, they can't answer it. Mm -hmm. But yet, the first and the last died, but now is alive forevermore. And they can't get around the fact that right. this is talking about Jesus. 
who is the first and the last, which they said is only Jehovah. And so they start backing out and saying, well, we got to go ask our elders. And they disappear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But our point here tonight is that that Jesus is highly exalted, one with the Father, both claiming first and last, because both are God eternal, Father and Son. Right? And that who is that who that's who is talking to John. And uh we're gonna we're running out of time, so we're gonna have to hurry. Uh and John is seeing Jesus for the first time in his glorified state. Right? He didn't know this Jesus uh before. All right. So this is the Jesus that with the trumpet voice of God glorified in his rightful place with God, as God, with God. And what follows is crucial. What follows, guys, is crucial. Someone read quickly so we don't run out of time. Verse 12 through 16. We want to get some of this down, this symbology. Come on, somebody. Then I turned to see the Lord that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Mm. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. Mm -hmm. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine grass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his count countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. All right, here's this amazing vision of the glorified Christ. Again, the first time John is gazing eyes upon the guy he's been preaching about and leading men to for the last few decades. And now he gets to see him again one more time, at least on this side of glory. Uh, he sees Jesus in the linen outfit from, from all, the, all the way down to his feet. And there's echoes of other biblical visions where we see a man clothed in linen. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 9 saw this a man clothed in linen in the temple in Jerusalem. Daniel, in chapter 7, saw the Ancient of Days, who his clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head white like wool. Uh, in Daniel 7, Daniel also saw one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, approaching the Ancient of Days, and led into his presence. So we see this imagery before, and all of these were representations of, of the God of Israel. But let's just talk about the symbology here. First of all, you're taking notes, write it down, because I'm going to speed up like an auctioneer so I can hurry up and get this done. But uh, the linen garment uh, was a symbol of authority, elder, or a judge. The, the golden sash was a symbol of the divine. Write this down. Gold throughout Revelation is a symbol of the divine. In the Old Testament as well, in the temple and tabernacle, gold represents God. Gold in the New Testament represents the divine. So write it down forever, gold is gonna be divine. His hair is white as snow or white as wool, which is a biblical symbol of wisdom. In fact, that is why even today, British judges wear those silly looking white wool, wool wigs. Mm -hmm. That, this is where they're getting it from, right here. It's a symbol of wisdom of a judge. And, and so, but Jesus is real. His hair was really white as snow, and it was a symbol of wisdom. His feet are as brass. Write this down. Brass is the biblical symbol of judgment in the Old Testament and the New. That's why on the altar of brass, the lamb was sacrificed. Judgment was satisfied. Uh, and in the New Testament, brass is a symbol of judgment. Eyes were like flames. That's eyes that are penetrating and all seeing. Sword from his mouth. What does the Bible call a double-edged sword? The word of God. So Jesus is the logos, the spoken, uttered word of God. Uh, and again, a very John theme here. Uh, 
And so we see this powerful symbology in the resurrected Christ. But look what happens to John. Now, by the way, and he sees Jesus walking in the midst of seven candlesticks and in his hand seven stars. We need to understand what those mean. So let's look at it. Somebody read like an au 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 auctioneer uh, uh, and let's read this. Which one? 17. What's on the screen? 17 and 18. Okay. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. So he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And mm -hmm. Amen. And I have the keys of the ease and death. All right. So, um, so Jesus uh, makes a declaration about his authority, right? He's the first and the last. He's the one who died, but he's alive. And remember when Jesus resurrected, he appeared to his disciples and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth have been given unto me. Go therefore, and he gives them the great command to go preach and reach. And, and now John, he's making a more emphasis, a, a stronger emphasis on this. He goes, I call the very keys now to, to death, hell, and the grave. And so his authority is all encompassing in the spiritual realm and in the physical realm as well. But but pay attention to what happens next. I didn't put this in there. In fact, look at verse 19 and 20. And Jesus gives an explanation. He says, write the things which you have seen and the things which are. And the things that which take, will take place after this, that's future. Because the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. Mm -hmm. All right. Here is what John is to write. What he sees, that's things that are present tense. And he's right about things in the future. In, in our last five minutes, I, I want to talk about the lampstand and the stars. Each of these lampstands represented a local church. Mm -hmm. Namely, these seven churches in Asia. Each of the stars in the hand of Jesus represented the pastor of that church. Now, to clear things up for yourself... The Bible, the Revelation calls them angels. They're not angels like with wings and glowing uh, swords by their side. The word angelos in the Greek means messenger. So when he calls them the angel of the church of Ephesus, he's literally in the Greek saying it to the messenger of the church of Ephesus. Because what he's saying here is what I'm about to say to Ephesus, John, write it down, but then give it to the messenger of Ephesus, the preacher, the pastor, so that he can convey this to that church. So, so in your notes where it says to the angel right next to their messenger, because that's what it means in the Greek, which in turn is the pastor of those churches. Let's wrap it up with this tonight. All right, lamp stands. Here's what we need to understand about this. This is powerful to me because, yes, there is a universal church, and that is very powerful. But this chapter is a powerful reminder that God also recognizes the local church. Yes, there is a universal worldwide church. We're all part of the church. Yes, we're all born into the same church. There's one church. Let's gather around the campfire and sing Kumbaya. But here Jesus is recognizing a local church and he knows each one of those local churches and he knows them personally and he's aware of their strengths and their weaknesses as a congregation. He even is aware of the people in the church who are doing well and those who aren't doing well. He knew them intimately. And I always ask wherever I pastor God, do you know us? Do you know City Mission? And everybody in it and our strengths and our weaknesses and things we need to straighten up with and the things we're doing well, what would his letter be to us? Mm -hmm. But he knows us. He knows City Mission. Yes. 
And even tonight when we were praying for, for a pastor in Ansbach, I said, Lord, you know that candlestick and you know what star you need to hold in your hand who belongs there. I've been praying because Jesus knows the local churches. So the stars in his hand, and I as a pastor love this because it's a comforting thing to me that the stars are in the hand of Jesus. They represent the pastor or messenger of each church. So, so he didn't call them pastors because he's not addressing that role. Mm -hmm. See, pastoring is when you feed and shepherd and tend. No, he needs them to be a messenger right now. Mm -hmm. I, the chief shepherd, am, am giving the word to these congregations. So I'm not calling you pastors, I'm calling you messengers because all you need to do is convey this. Mm -hmm. Convey this. And remember, he knew each one of these pastors by name. He held them in his hand. And it's a reminder that a pastor is not just an employee. He or she is known and recognized by Jesus, held by him in his hand. Who did Jesus send the revelation to? Uh, who did Jesus address in each church? Not the church mama, not the deacons, not the oldest of the elder board, not the church secretary. When it came to the congregation, he addressed the messenger. How much time? Oh, y'all, y'all just took all my time up. Nice. <laughs> all right, let me just, I don't have to stop right there. Any comments on that? Isn't that cool? He, he knows who we are. That's the bottom line. He knows who we are. Yeah. Um, you said that he was addressing the, the seven churches because those were the churches where John was the bishop. That's pro, these are probabilities. probabilities? Yes, okay. Okay. John was the bishop of Asia Minor, mm -hmm. and these were churches under his care. Mm -hmm. And so it makes sense that if he's addressing each messenger of the church, mm -hmm. he's also going to address first the bishop over those messengers, because okay. mm -hmm. God is a God of structure and order. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I missed um, the book of Revelation written for all the year. It the say, island of Patmos. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's time frame is expected. Yeah. Right? By the way, in closing, <clears throat> uh, there are some people out there, very tiny group of people that uh, say that revelations and everything in it already happened. And they're evangelicals out there. And I call them loosely evangelicals. They're, it's a small group. I'll be nice. There's a group out there uh, uh, who who teach a lot of other wild stuff, but but they some guy had a revelation that Jesus can't come back until the church takes dominion, uh, dominion of governments, dominion over the media, dominion over the education system, dominion over there's like seven things or twelve. Do you remember Brian? You've heard it. And once, once we get dominion over these things, then we can get the earth ready for Jesus to come back. And since he got it, he wrote this book. And people bought into it, but there's an inconvenient truth. The book of Revelation. Someone else got a revelation before this dude. And so now that group is saying, well, revelation already happened. This is not what's going to be happening. Believe it or not, that kind of stuff happens in the U.S. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and they, they, but here's the issue with that. It's impossible because as far as I know, Revelation says Jesus comes back riding on a white horse and that hadn't happened in history yet. Uh, as far as I know, uh, demon, uh, demonic spirits will be unleashed on the earth to torment mankind. And in history books I've read, that hadn't happened. Uh, Revelation says one third of the earth will burn with fire, one third of the oceans will be poison, one third of the atmosphere will go up in flames. That hasn't happened. Yet. And, you know, so come on, people. Uh, let's just, we won't go there, but you need to know it's out there. All right? Stand with me, because. Closing comments, questions? All right, guys, hey, uh, get your folder. Next week, we're going to look at these seven churches. Uh, why he addressed them, things that he said, what can we learn from them, uh, what they went through. Um, 
And uh, so your folders, so you can add to it every week. And we're going to be, there's so much here. Uh, but we, we made it through chapter one. We just had to go over four minutes, but that was y'all's fault. Uh, <laughs> who, who wants to close this or not? Uh, Jerome and Lucha, y'all going to be leaving us. We pray covering over y'all. Have a beautiful time. Be with your family. Come back to us uh, whole and, and, and refreshed. All right? Uh, so would you close us in prayer? Uh -huh. Father, we thank you for this night, Father. Yes, Lord. We thank you for the word that has been taught to us tonight, Lord. Yes, Lord. Let's let our church family continue yes, to study Revelation. Yes, Lord. Let them be excited. Let them invite mm -hmm. other family members to church that they are missing out, Lord. Yes, Lord. And we thank you for your many blessings. Protect us as we go home, Lord. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all were awesome. Apologize for holding y'all over.